Well, welcome to 7 Under Club Interactive. All eyes are currently on the Middle East and on Islam. On today's show, we're going to discuss what Muslims believe about the end times and the Mahdi. That's the coming Islamic leader that will one day bring salvation to the Muslim people. Problem is, in order for the Mahdi to appear, Israel and America must be destroyed. George Thomas has more. Amidst the chants of death to America, death to Israel, President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad recently announced to massive crowds in Iran that a new Middle East is emerging. With the grace of God and thanks to the resistance of nations, the new Middle East will be realized soon without the American and the Zionist regimes. The arrogant powers will have no place in that Middle East. He says the chaos in the region is organized by the Imam Mahdi. The final move has begun, Ahmadinejad said. We are in the middle of a world revolution managed by this deer, reference here to the 12th Imam. A great awakening is unfolding. One can witness the hand of Imam in managing it. Ahmadinejad also believes the U.S. and Israel would soon be destroyed with divine assistance. Whatever you think of him, this 53-year-old president of Iran is a deeply religious man. To understand his religious convictions, you have to go to a mosque in the small village of Jamkaran, tucked in a corner of Iran. Behind this mosque, there is a well. And according to Ahmadinejad and millions of Shiite Muslims, out of this well will emerge one day their version of an Islamic savior. They call him the Mahdi or the 12th Imam. Joel Rosenberg has written a book about it. It was believed that this, this Islamic leader uh, was going to come back one day at the end of time and bring justice to the earth. Tens of thousands of Muslims visit the sacred well each night. The opening of the well is covered by a green-like metal box to prevent people from jumping in. Most of the time here is spent praying and kissing the metal box. Others scribble prayer requests to the Mahdi on pieces of paper that are then dropped into the well. This day belongs to the Mahdi, and I have come to share my heart with him. Many, like this young boy with a flashlight, believe the Mahdi is actually hiding at the bottom of the well reading those prayer requests. I was looking into the well with my flashlight hoping to see the Mahdi, but not tonight. Rosenberg says the Mahdi, a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, vanished in the middle of the ninth century. Shia Muslims expect the 12th Imam to return at the end of history, at the end of days, when there's a time of great genocide, warfare, chaos in the world. Enter Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Since becoming the president of Iran back in 2005, Ahmadinejad has emerged as the Mahdi's most influential follower. In almost all his speeches, whether at home in Iran or traveling abroad, the president begs Allah to hasten the return of the Mahdi. O God, hasten the arrival of Imam Mahdi and grant him good health and victory and make us his followers. Ahmadinejad is reportedly tied to a radical Islamic society in Iran that believes man can hasten the appearance of the Mahdi by annihilating two countries, Israel, which they call the Little Satan, and the United States, which they call the Great Satan. Shiite eschatology says the Mahdi's second coming will be marked by apocalyptic times. Wars, famines, and floods will ravage the earth followed by judgment day and a battle between good and evil. There's also the belief that when the Mahdi comes back, he will be accompanied by Jesus Christ. This will all come true under the rule of the perfect man, the last divine source on earth, the Mahdi, who will re-emerge, and Jesus Christ and the other noble men will accompany him. But until that day comes, Ahmadinejad, who sees himself as a kind of John the Baptist figure, is telling the world to prepare. He believes the end of time is near, that the Islamic Messiah is coming, and the way to accelerate or hasten the 12th Imam's arrival and reign on earth is to, to destroy Judeo-Christian civilization as we know it. And that's what makes Ahmadinejad so dangerous, because he and his regime are pursuing the very nuclear weapons that would enable them 
to bring about this wholesale destruction of uh, Jewish and Christian society as we've known it so far. Well, for more on this story, please welcome George Thomas to 700 Club Interactive. Um, George, this is, uh, yeah, I think most Americans don't know about this. No. In, in terms of just the political leadership and the religious le leadership in Iran, they, they truly believe this. This is not something that they think is a, is a myth, but they, they act on this. They absolutely did. And in fact, when Ahmadinejad came to power in 2005, we began to hear these ramblings about the Mahdi. And, and a few years later, I actually went to Iran. And I was, you know, just a few feet from him when he would make these speeches. And I thought perhaps he comes to the U.S. and talks about these, these religious awakenings and calling people to Islam and begging for the Mahdi, the 12th Imam, to come. I thought this was basically speeches he would make in the United States, in the West. I went to his home country, and almost every speech he starts out, Mahdi, we beg you to come back. We ask you to come. What can we do to make your faithful ready and prepared for your time of arrival? And so it's not just to the Western world. This is something that, that courses through his veins. And we have to understand it because, you know, this is a man who is deeply religious. And to, to say otherwise and to, to look at the geopolitical issues that are today facing the Middle East and Iran without the emphasis and understanding of his Islamic bent and his, and his theology would be a huge disservice, not just to us as Christians, but also to those in foreign policy, the makers in the United States and in other Western countries. Well, after his speech to the UN, yeah. he went back and started ex exclaiming how important that was mm -hmm. and how the audience in the UN was liter literally stunned. That's right that there was a holy silence right. that entered into the room. And in fact, in some of the videos you mentioned, he, he's talking to some of the, the various um, uh, imams from Qom, uh, the, the religious center for the Shia Muslims. And he says, it felt like when I was standing at the UN in 2005, his sort of grand stage, his moment of arrival on the international scene as the president of, of uh, Iran, he says, I felt this bright light. And I felt people say that he, he got his sort of mission to be the John the Baptist, the man who would help pave the way for the imam's return. In fact, since 2005, the man has spent millions of dollars paving the road from Tehran to Jamkaran. He's made a, a railway uh, line that connects these two cities as well as other main cities to this mosque right outside of Qom. So he spent a lot of money, in essence, preparing, getting the nation ready. Listen, that this arrival is happening. Also, interestingly, he spent a lot of money on developing a, th a think tank. Basically, people from around Iran and around the world, Shia Muslims, can call, in, in, in essence, to a 1-800 number in Iran. People have got questions about the Mahdi. What are the signs? When will he come? What will he look like? Are there, are there things that we need to be doing in our lifetime to prepare? Uh, those kinds of questions. Islamic scholars who not only read the Quranic texts, but also read the Bible. Why? Because people are mm. going to be asking, wait a minute, this, this whole thing about the Mahdi coming back in times of war and famine, it sounds like the return of Jesus Christ. What's the difference? And so those scholars who are sitting in, in Qom, need to understand what does the Bible say about the return of Isa, the prophet Isa, the prophet Jesus? What mm -hmm. does the Bible say about it? So when people call in, they want to make sure that they understand the differences between these two Isla uh, messiahs that are, that are scheduled to come back. Well, what do the Iranians believe about Isa? I mean, it, I assume that they don't buy into the Christian view no, of absolutely. the second coming. No, in fact, they, they, they don't believe he died. He is, in essence, in what they say, suspended animation. Uh, he, he did not die, and he will, in essence, uh, in, in terms of Islamic eschatology, specifically for Shia Muslims, they believe that when the Mahdi comes back, he will be accompanied by Jesus Christ. And in essence, the role that Jesus plays which is very interesting. It is to, uh, to kill the Antichrist. The Muslims refer to him as Dajjal. Uh, he would uh, break all the crosses. He would kill the Jews. And in essence, he will reign with the Mahdi for 40 years. He would get married, have children. Uh, and after a 40-year period, he will die, will be buried next to the Prophet Muhammad in Medina. But the key role that Jesus plays in all of this 
is the defeat of the Antichrist. That is the role, which is, makes me wonder why the Mahdi can't do this himself. All right, well, what's their view of the Antichrist? Because they, they, you know, they clearly have said the United States is the great Satan. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that really hasn't penetrated uh, our consciousness as to the intense meaning behind that and, and what they, they believe. So for a Muslim, who is the Antichrist and when does he appear? It's, deba it's debatable because they don't necessarily make direct references uh, in the Quran to the Antichrist. He is seen as a person who will emerge out of the Arab world. Some have said, well, he'll come out of Yemen. Others have said, other uh, uh, per folks who interpret the hadiths uh, and interpret the lines of the Quran say that he will come out of Morocco. No one is for sure certain about who this Antichrist will, will be, uh, uh, what form he takes, but definitely will come out of the Middle East. What's interesting is that they, they look for signs. You know, in Christendom, we look for signs of the, the soon return of Jesus Christ. Uh, in, in Islam, they, they have major and minor signs. They look at, you know, when the Jews would begin to return to the Holy Land, when there is this battle between the Jews and, and, and Islam, when they, when they say that the, the sun rises out of the West, when there's so much corruption, when family disintegration takes place, when there's uh, a rampant pornography, rampant murder and, and violence and so forth. Those are the signs that they're looking right, for. Haven't, haven't various Muslim sects uh, thought that the Mahdi has already come? That's I correct. know in Sudan, uh, you go back to 1890 and the uh, struggle against British rule there, um, they were encouraged by a military leader that they thought was the Mahdi. Have there been others in, in the history? There have several been. And, and, you know, again, for the Sunni Muslims, they don't necessarily believe, you know, I was mentioning in this piece, that, that the Mahdi, the 12th Imam, according to Shia Muslims, uh, he disappeared uh, in the early centuries and he, he was in essence uh, kept away from the public and that he is roaming the earth and at one appointed time he will come. Sunni Muslims believe, no, it'll happen like this. That it would, he, he is not on the earth. He will be born of, they say, the, the, uh, the sister of Muhammad, Fatima, uh, the line of Muhammad, uh, and that he will appear suddenly. Uh, and those are the two different, the main two differences between the Shia and the Sunni Muslims in terms of the return of the Mahdi. In fact, uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad belo belongs to a sect in Islam, which is very interesting. He belongs to a sect called the Hojati community. And in essence, this particular sect of Shia Islam they believe that man has a very significant role in speeding up the return mm. of the Mahdi. And how do you do that? By creating chaos. Create so much chaos in the world that the Mahdi would be compelled to come back to bring a, a time of peace and justice. And so making Ahmadinejad's belief makes it all the more, his particular belief in the role that man has to play in the return of the Shia Muslim right, makes well, it a little bit more challenging. Let's boil it down to contemporary politics and, and what does this mean for Israel? What does it mean for America? Uh, we, we saw a, them in an earnest attempt to, to, to acquire nuclear weapons. I mean, they make all kinds of public statements. No, this is peaceful. We're just trying to have a reactor. Um, but there was um, efforts to refine uranium to something that was a weapon. And, um, there was an interesting worm that destroyed their centrifuges, so it delayed it. But for me, the key here was to find in WikiLeaks those diplomatic exchanges that the Saudis right. were encouraging the United States mm -hmm. to stop Iran from getting a bomb. That's right. I found that just unbelievable. Not just the Saudis, Hosni Mubarak was absolutely, he, he, was, he was in essence saying to the U.S. government, look, you need to take this guy out. You have to take out these nuclear facilities. Like you mentioned, Saudi Arabia. Uh, what does this mean for us? You ha we have to, I think there is a foregone conclusion within the intelligence community, within our State Department, within the Obama administration, uh, that, that Iran is fairly um, soon going to go nuclear. Uh, and what does that mean? It means that the entire geopolitical landscape of the Middle East uh, overnight changes. Why? Because there is only one Muslim country, Sunni Muslim country, that has an atomic bomb, and that is Pakistan. Iran, uh, and it's a Sunni country. Pakistan, as you know, is majority Sunni. 
Iran getting a nuclear bomb would be, in essence, the Shiite nuclear bomb. Uh, and that changes the entire dynamics. Why? Because suddenly, as you mentioned, the Saudis say, wait a minute, we can't have our Shiite brothers having a nuclear bomb, and we won't. The same can be said for Egypt, Bahrain, Qatar, and the other um, Sunni-majority countries. And so you could potentially see an armed uh, nuclear uh, proliferation, those who want to acquire a nuclear bomb, just because that the Shiites, the, Sunni, the, the, the Iranians have... Uh, have a nuclear uh, weapon. It changes well, things quite there's significantly. A, there's a difference between acquisition and use. Yes, absolutely. Do you think he'd use it? Man, that's a tough question. Because I think at the end of the day, who knows? Uh, I mean, it, it, it definitely fits in all the stuff that we've been reporting on CBN News over the years. It, it fits in his theology. Acquiring a nuclear uh, weapon, if he believes that man has a role, and if he believes, which he truly does, that he has been appointed by Muhammad to be the man who would usher in this 12th imam. He has this end time philosophy and his role in the end times of, of, the, of the earth. Absolutely. Why not? I mean, what does he have to lose? I must say to our viewers that one, you know, I've had the privilege of traveling around the world over my years here at CBN. The one country I get often asked about is, what's your favorite country that you've gone to? And I always say Iran. Mm. Iran, the Iranian people are absolutely beautiful people. And I, and I think part of it is because 70 percent, this will stagger many of our viewers, and it is the case across the Middle East today, which I am hopeful about. 70% of Iranians today are below the age of 30. What does that mean, Gordon? That means, for our historians out there on, in, the, in the audience, 1979, when the revolution took place, the majority of those who walk the streets of Iran today, they, they have no idea what happened in 1979. They were either born right before or right after the Islamic revolution. And so they are wandering the streets of Iran saying, folks, what did my parents believe in? This Islamic revolution, this Islamic revival that our parents fought for and were against the Americans. We took hostage of their embassy in downtown Tehran. What is this for? What, is, what, what was it worth all of these years, 32 years later? What have we got? Look at our society. And now this, you know, the, the thing is you go up to any seven-story building in downtown Tehran. There is no skyline to speak of, of Tehran. Why? Because you go up to the seventh floor of any building in Iran today, in Tehran, downtown Tehran. It is an eyesore, Gordon. Why? Because tucked beneath the, the, the crevices of every apartment building are satellite dishes. They're banned. But today, millions of Iranians have a view of the outside world. And these white-bearded mullahs that have control over the country, they absolutely cannot stop modernity from slapping Iranians in the face because they have access to the Internet, they have access to Facebook, access to Twitter, access to satellite television. And for the first time, maybe not since the 1979 revolution, folks are saying, wait a minute, you talk about Islam. Look, I want to be a good Muslim. But I also want the freedom to listen to my iPod. I want the freedom to wear a miniskirt. I want a, the freedom to wear lipstick and makeup and, and not necessarily have to cover my head like all, most the majority of Iranians uh, have to women today. So you have a young population that is asking these very, very deep questions about their faith. Are they saying no to Islam? Not necessarily. You see that these protests on the streets of, of the Middle East. Are they saying no to Islam? No. They are saying yes to freedom. They're not necessarily saying yes to democracy. They're not saying necessarily no to Islam. They want to try and figure out how do we live in the 21st century in the advent of Facebook and Twitter and Internet and satellite techno technology? How do we deal with living in the 21st century, having a life for my future, getting married, having children, being able to own a home, have a car, stuff that we all in America dream for, uh, but at the same time, be a good Muslim? All right, so you're hopeful for the future. I, I, I am. You know, I the am. revolutions in Tunisia, Egypt, Bahrain, you, you think am, stable am, democracies I, are going to end up... No, 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 no. Hold on a second. 
Stable democracies is a different, you know, is a completely different verbiage. Now you're taking me on another. This is the, how, how much time we got? We, we got more time? No, I'm kidding. No, but see. All right, so not a stable. No, 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 because. because Muslim Brotherhood's going to take Well, it. here's the thing. What I'm looking for, when I look at these demonstrations in, in Algiers, in Tunisia, in Libya, in Tripoli, and so forth, I'm looking for Muslims who have the guts to stand up and say, we do not want Sharia law to be part of governance in a future Egypt, in a future Yemen, in a future Bahrain. So far, you don't see protesters saying, we want freedom for freedom of religion. We want freedom from religion. We want minority faiths to be protected. We want women to be protected. You know, I, I keep sending out these emails in our newsroom since the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. I say, folks, Iraq and Afghanistan are not the model of democracy in the Middle East. Because today, I have met so many, Gordon, so many Iraqi Christians, Afghan believers who say, wait a minute, you guys spent billions of dollars coming to overthrow our nations. 4,000 plus American men and women have sacrificed their lives. Today, you're spending billions more to keep these countries going. How come me as an Afghan Christian cannot go out on the streets of Kabul? And tell people, listen, you know what? Many years ago, I walked away from Islam. And I've embraced this man from Galilee. His name is Jesus Christ. And I want to share this with you, with others. How come today an Iraqi cannot do that in the new Iraq? You know, we spend so much money drafting these constitutions for Afghanistan right. and, and both Iraq. Constitutions and both constitutions enshrine Sharia and so, as part of the constitutional so we, fabric. You know, so this idea of democracy... And so you, you look at it and, and go... Frankly, the Bush administration, what, what were you thinking about? Why, and why did just, you do and, it that And way? not just the Bush administration, but the Obama administration. Holding these people Obama's accountable. Obama's not responsible for either constitution. Yeah. Sorry. No, yeah. you're right. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. It should have been done 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's squarely on, on the Bush administration. That yeah. Sharia was put in both of them. All right, we can talk a long time. Yeah, we can. Uh, we gave you a, a little inside look in into... Um, CBN News and, and uh, George Thomas and his views. Um, but get informed. Um, you know, if you can, read as much as you, as you can about Islam. I, it, these are crucial times. What's going on in the Middle East is going to affect us all for decades. Well, coming up, Operation Blessing is in Israel helping Muslims in need of food. That's next on 700 Club Interactive. Everybody wants to find the next Ronald Reagan. Where is he slash she? I began working with Ronald Reagan in 1974. Ronald Reagan inspired this country to believe in itself again. The older I get, the smarter Ronald Reagan gets. They called him the great communicator. Tear down this wall. Is there anyone out there who even comes close? In search of the next Ronald Reagan. On the 700 Club, next... If you're an individual group or business needing a dental plan, Avia Dental offers group plans for as little as $5 per month. Now members of your group can save up to 50% or more off a high quality dental care. Everyone qualifies and there's no waiting or limits on visits to the dentist. Visit aviadental.com or call 1-888-431-CARE. Avia Dental since 1994. Smile, you're with people who care. Well, Operation Blessing Israel is reaching out, not just to Israelis, but also to Palestinians in the West Bank. Recently, we visited an entire village in desperate need of food and medical care. The hills of Judea are dotted with caves. For Suha and her seven children, this cave is home. They live, eat, and sleep in this tiny space with no heat, no running water and just a few mats on a dirt floor. Suha's husband is a carpenter, but most of the time he's away looking for work. It's hard for him to find work here. It's very difficult for us to get the things we need. Suha and her family live in one of the poorest Arab villages in the West Bank. Many families have 10 or 15 people crowded into small shanties or tents. Others, like Suha, live in caves. The town has no electricity and very little water. 
People here are farmers and shepherds by trade, but the land is too dry to farm, and raising livestock is difficult for people who can barely afford to feed themselves. That's why Operation Blessing Israel decided to help the people of this Muslim village. We gave them drinking water and bags full of food, staples like rice, beans, eggs, and cooking oil. The bags also contain soap, toothbrushes, and toys for the kids. Most people here can't afford to see a doctor, so Operation Blessing also sponsored a health clinic where people lined up for free medical care. The people in this village say they won't forget their visit from Operation Blessing, and Suha is grateful to get extra help feeding her children. We needed food. Thank you. This food is very big help to keep my children healthy. We're reaching out with hands of love and compassion, and Operation Blessing Israel is part of that. And it's not just to the Christians, it's not just to the Jews, it's also to the Muslims, and it's even to none of the above. If people don't have any religious belief at all, we still want to help them if they're, in, if they're in need. If you want to join in what we're doing, it's real easy. Just say, I want to be part of the 700 Club. I want to reach out to people in need. I want to help people, and I want to show them love, that God loves them. If you want to be a part of it, call us, 888-777-1999, or log on to CBN.com uh, and just say, I want to be a member. How much is it? $20 a month, 65 cents a day, and you join with tens of thousands of people that want to make a difference in the world today. We've got time for a chat question. Stacy has it. Doug writes in, he says, it's interesting that Islam believes Jesus will return with the Mahdi when Israel is destroyed, but surely they understand that Jesus is Jewish, don't they? All right, George, they, they get that, don't they? They do, absolutely. But, you know, I think, you know, you have to look at it from the perspective of Christianity existed way before Islam existed. And in essence, you have the Prophet Muhammad who had uh, understandings of this man called Jesus and understood uh, the, the, the scriptures. And in essence, if you look at the similarities between our view of the return of Jesus Christ and the view of of the Shia Muslims or the Sunni Muslims, their Islamic savior. There's a lot of similarities. And the question is, who stole from the other? I mean, I think I know, we know the answer uh, to that. Uh, but in essence, you have folks who say, look, and, and that's why, I, you know, to a large extent, uh, President Ahmadinejad has, has set up this think tank because people are asking the question, how come this looks so similar to what the, the people of, of, of the book, of the Bible, believe in. How come there is no stark difference between our two understandings of the end times? Uh, did, the, did, the, did the Prophet Muhammad, did he really get this divine inspiration and, and understanding of the end times, or did he view the, the Jewish people and their view of, of, of the return of the Messiah? Uh, and did he, did, you know, did he borrow from them, in, in essence? Well, I think... Quite clearly, he borrowed from them, and he had a Jewish wife. Mm -hmm. um, and there was certainly what he borrowed from the Christian community. The number of prayers per day is directly from the Damascus and, and Antioch Christian communities of the 7th century. And then what he borrowed from the Old Testament prophets, all Jewish, um, you know, the, the Bible is quite clear. To them was given the oracles of God. To the Jewish people was given the oracles of God. Um, and he borrowed quite heavily from them. So uh, to see it today with the enmity between them and the desire to literally wipe them all out. I mean, the, uh, the current head, the spiritual head of the Muslim Brotherhood says it would be virtuous for them to completely kill every man, woman, and child in Israel. Uh, that that would be a righteous thing for them to do. Uh, and to hear that echoed in the streets of Cairo mm -hmm. just in the past few weeks is, is I think, monumental. And I think we need to wake up and pay attention to what they're saying uh, at, the, at the mosque. Mm -hmm. what, what are the imams saying at the mosque, in the prayers? What is the religious drive to wipe out Israel? And we're part of that. Yeah. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the discussion today, um, and we're going to have more. Uh, tomorrow on uh, what is Islam? What, what's, what's coming? What, what, what interpretation do we need as Christians to, to make out of the current turmoil in the Middle East? 
the number of revolutions. So um, stay tuned. There'll be more. We leave you with this word from 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. God bless you. We'll see you again.